All right, folks. Today's topic is from alchemy to chemistry. We are going to be moving forward in time. We're leaping forward from about the year like 900 AD, right, or 900 CE, the golden age of Islam. We're moving into the 1600s and uh, 1700s, right? So we are jumping forward and we're moving from the Middle East up into Europe. We're going to spend some time in Germany and then we're going to move over to France for today's lesson. In terms of the topics that we are going to cover, a lot is going to come up today. You're going to see guiding points two through seven show up. So there's going to be an example of an element being discovered. So how has our understanding of elements in the periodic table changed over time? That's going to be part of this. There is going to be some scientists building on their predecessors' work. There is going to be a pretty important leap forward in how science is done. There's going to be an example of a mistake that leads to new discoveries. There is going to be probably the single most important data point about how our understanding of matter and its ability to change, be created, or destroy change over time. And we're going to see some pretty important examples of how identity has impacted people's experiences with the sciences. So guiding points two through seven are going to show up today. From alchemy to chemistry is sort of today's overarching topic, just like the first day was the Greek natural philosophers, the second day's overarching topic was uh, the golden age of Islam, today's overarching topic is from alchemy to chemistry, and we're going to talk about several people along the way. Yes, nine. Okay, so for the thing on the slide, mm -hmm. that uh, go under... Right, so at this point in time, uh, Europe is kind of starting to get these ideas about the scientific method or finally beginning to make their way up from the Middle East into Europe. Uh, people have noticed that there are certain ways in which you can combine substances and then get new things out. And so folks are very interested in trying to figure out, hey, is there some way that we could take cheap substances and turn something like lead and turn it into a valuable and expensive substance? like gold. Uh, the people who are trying to do this call themselves alchemists. And while that's like the overarching goal of the medieval alchemists, in practice they begin to do some much more specific work along the way. Enter these two fellows, Johann Becker and George Stahl. They, they didn't work together. Becker comes first and then Stahl is going to be building on Becker's work. So Becker did a lot more of the like theory and concept and Stahl did a lot of the testing it out with experiments. So, Becker and Stahl both studied combustion. They studied what happened when you burn things. And there are some pretty clear experiments that they can run. When you burn things, you start out with a big object, you set it on fire, afterwards you're left with a bunch of ash and charcoal and smaller stuff. So there's this really clear pattern of when you burn things, they get lighter. Right? It's like some mass is disappearing somewhere. And so what Becker and Stahl are looking into is what is this stuff that seems to be disappearing, that seems to be lost when you burn something. So if we think back to like, you know, Empedocles, Empedocles would say, oh, you're releasing the air element that's being burned, and the burning is an example of the fire element being released, and the charcoal and dust is the uh, example of the earth element. That's how the ancient Greeks would have thought about this. Now, with like Becker and Stahl, they're saying, okay, we've got this substance, we've set it on fire, something is clearly lost. They have a name for this something, which seems to be disappearing when you burn things. They call it phlogiston. P-H-L-O-G-I-S-T-O-N. Phlogiston. Uh, it's written on the slide here. P-H-L-O-G-I-S-T-O-N. Phlogiston. Now, what they notice is that if you have something that's on fire and you put it in a closed container, pretty much immediately what happens to that fire, or within a few seconds? It dies. Yeah, fires will die if you put them in a sealed container. And so their explanation for this is that 
when you burn something, you're releasing this phlogiston. And when you release that phlogiston, it's being sort of absorbed into the air. Uh, if you ever, has anyone here ever made sweet tea or Kool-Aid or something where there's like a powder that's being dissolved in water? Yeah. Right? When you do that, like imagine you're making Kool-Aid. There's like a certain amount of water they say you're supposed to like add to Kool-Aid. But of course, you're going to add more Kool-Aid dust than, they, than, it's, than the recommended amount. And you're going to add way more sugar than the recommended amount. Right? Just obviously everyone knows this is the correct approach. If you do this, what you'll find is that first you stick your, your sugar or your powder uh, into your water and it just sort of disappears into the water. It fully dissolves. But if you keep adding more and more and more, then it stops being able to be absorbed by the water, it stops dissolving, and it just starts to settle down at the bottom, right? That's called saturation. There's like only so much of your Kool-Aid packet or your sugar that can actually be absorbed by the water. And what Becker and Stahl think is happening is they think there's a limit to how much phlogiston the air can absorb. And since they think the process of burning, they think the process of burning is just releasing your phlogiston into the air, and therefore the reason why you can't burn something if you have it in an enclosed container is they think the air gets saturated with phlogiston and then it won't let you pull any, it won't let you release any more from the object. So that's their explanation for why, uh, you know, a candle goes out if you put it under a jar. Now, flames, candles, matches, those are not the only things that very quickly go out if they're in a sealed container without fresh air. What else is going to go out? Humans, animals, creatures, bugs, right? Any sort of critter cannot survive without fresh air. Oh, wow. So they think, and here, look, phlogiston is not real. They are wrong about phlogiston completely and entirely. But there are some aspects of this idea that are kind of getting at some fundamental truths. And one of those aspects is that there is something kind of fundamentally similar about breathing and burning. A candle or a creature cannot survive without the chair. The alchemist's explanation for this is that people basically, or animals, creatures, produce phlogiston in our bodies and it builds up and they think the reason why we need to breathe isn't about what we breathe in, but it's rather about what we breathe out. They think we're breathing out the phlogiston and that we need to get rid of this poison in order to be able to survive. So they're basically saying, hey, breathing isn't actually about taking something in, it's about getting rid of this bad thing. And so that's why they think you need to breathe. And that's their explanation for why, you know, a creature in an enclosed container isn't gonna be able to survive, right? It's because it'll breathe out phlogiston until it saturates the air and then it'll die. Right? Because it won't be able to get rid of the phlogiston anymore, so it'll gradually poison itself. So there's parts of this that are utter nonsense. Phlogiston is not real. It's not that you need air to burn something because you need to soak the air full of something. It's because there's something in the air that's crucial to doing the burning in the first place. So they have sort of mistaken the important gas. They kind of they it's it's almost like they think carbon dioxide is the important part but really it's the oxygen that's the important part, right? Oxygen hasn't been discovered yet. Carbon dioxide has not been discovered yet. They don't know what these gases actually are, but they have this word phlogiston, and they're using that to explain things. In some ways, they're getting close to the truth. In other ways, they're way off. Nyan? Okay. All right. Now, there are some problems with this idea. One of the big problems with this idea is it relies on this concept of phlogiston being released is what burning is. And of course, that doesn't work with everything. Y'all might not know this, um, but when you burn metals, they actually get heavier. Metals are heavier after you burn them, while non-metals tend to get lighter, right? Things like organic materials usually get lighter when you burn them, but metals get heavier. So that is sort of a, a problem, a flaw in this concept of phlogiston. All right, 
So I tell you all this so that I can sort of set the scene. This is where we currently are. This is sort of the, the scientific consensus when we get to our next pair. 